the ultimate dream team, a club accustomed to success. But back in the 1950s, life wasn't so good for Real Madrid. That'll change with the arrival of Alfredo Di Stefano. His impact was huge. His brilliance saw him become a club legend. He remains a Bernabeu hero to this day. Before joining Real, Di Stefano had already achieved legendary status with Colombian side Milenarios. In their prime, Milenarios were one of the best clubs in the world. They're one of the biggest clubs in Colombia. They've been crowned champions 13 times. And back in the 50s, they had the best players in the world, let alone South America. Great players have played for this club, winning everything in their time. They even beat Real Madrid on their own ground. So playing for a club like this is a great honour. Formed in 1946, it didn't take long for Milanarios to dominate the Colombian domestic game. Nicknamed the Blue Ballet, they won title after title. In 1953, they memorably defeated Real Madrid in a friendly. But then the club suffered a sharp decline, which continues to this day. There are big problems financially. But when I was offered the position, I was working in Mexico at a second division team. And when I was asked to come here, I didn't hesitate. To me, Milonarios is class and it shows. I know it's going through a difficult time, but it seems that this could change. Milonarios last won the Colombian title 15 years ago. But since then, the team have enjoyed little success. Several runners-up spots in the mid-90s offered some hope. The financial troubles have left the club struggling to compete with the elite. Now, Milanarios are hoping to rediscover those glory days. I started looking for a number of players that would feel that they belong to this institution, because that feeling had been lost. On the financial side, I was honest with the players and told them, this is a complicated situation. We're looking for a sponsor. If we can find one, we're going to benefit financially if we do well. But it's not easy. We'd lost it. We'd lost it. But this year, the team has earned more respect. Now, when the other sides play against us, they know that they're confronting a big club, a great side. I think what we have done is to make our team a force to be reckoned with. If their form has deserted them, then their fans certainly haven't. Their passion for their heroes remains strong despite having had little to celebrate. With the club on the rise again, spirits are high. Historically, the fans retain strong links with Argentinian giants River Plate. Di Stefano played for both teams, and River's nickname is Milanarios. The similarities don't end there. I think our fans are like the fans in Argentina. They sing throughout the game. I think they make this a great club. Milanarios match days in Bogotá are always a colourful and noisy affair. After many false starts, the fans finally have something to shout about. Last year gave everyone at Milanarios hope for the future. The club achieved their highest league finish in seven years by finishing second. Playoff disappointment followed, but it seems to suggest that the Milanarios revival was finally underway. The current star of the team is Colombian international midfielder Mayor Candelo. Candelo has been ably assisted by striker Julian Telef. His goals have proved crucial. Telef is now a firm favourite with the fans. I'm proud to play for this club. The fans in Bogota are some of the best and most passionate fans in the country. We desperately want to win the title for them. I think this club epitomizes football in Colombia. There's now a better organization that will improve the club and give it new life. Milanarios, a club using their rich history to improve the future.
North Wales recently, some rather unusual visitors. Travelling around 3,000 miles, they came all the way from Malawi. The Makili Bullets were in Wrexham to play the local side, and it was never going to be an ordinary match. The Bullets are Malawi's most successful side. They were in the United Kingdom for a short tour. Their first match had seen them share a six-goal thriller with English third division side Boston United. Now they had Wrexham firmly in their sights. It was the home side who opened the scoring soon after the break. Substitute Steve Thomas firing the Red Dragons in front. The bullet spirits weren't dampened though by the heavy rain and towards the end of the match they found their shooting boots. Malawian international Robert Ngambis scored a deflected equaliser. And it finished 1-1. As they trooped off, the Bullets received a generous ovation from the locals. The boys from Blantyre could reflect on some valuable lessons learnt from their tour. Their visit had been a resounding success. Well, our purpose has been mainly to, to play two uh, friendly games with Rexham and uh, Boston United. Then again to expose our boys into international uh, football and again to see how, I mean, British players uh, actually uh, uh, expose themselves in terms of preparations before the game. Malawi lies in the heart of East Africa and has a population of 12 million. It was only in 1986 that the country started a national football league. The Bullets were the first champions. And since then, they've won a further seven titles. They are by far the most successful team in Malawi. Well, like Manchester United here, and like in Malawi, we are the most famous team in Malawi, and we are the grammar side, that side. We've won almost everything, every cup. Being the number one side in the country has had its advantages. Such is their standing that earlier this year the Malawian president, Dr. Bikili Malusi, helped organize financial backing. His support has proved invaluable. Football is very, very expensive and actually it needs a, uh, a lot of money to get to the next stage. It's not that easy. So basically what I can say here is that um, we have to invest quite a lot so that at least we could be there. Despite their high-profile sponsor, money is still tight for the bullets. In Malawi, 65% of the population live below the poverty line. Football receives little in the way of official funding. The lack of facilities in Malawi was made even more apparent by this tour. No, the facilities are not that good. They are not that good. Yeah, not as we have seen because we went to Rexham. They've got a nice stadium. That stadium, if it was in Malawi, it was going to be the best stadium in Malawi but we don't have that kind of stadium in Malawi, so you, you can see that the facilities are not that good. One area that offers financial opportunities is the transfer market. Canada, Denmark, Russia and South Africa all have Malawians in their leagues. At present, England has none. The Bullets players were keen to impress their opponents. A move to Europe is every player's dream. English football in Malawi is rated high than any other football, football thing in the world. It's treated high. The Manchester United, the Arsenal, there are so many supporters of the English game in Malawi. So to play, if one, if one will manage, one player will manage to come here and play, it will be a dream for all the nation. The Bullets tour saw them give a fine account of themselves, helping raise the profile of Malawian football in general. The hope now is that they can follow in the footsteps of Africa's super clubs and become a team with a global reputation. Achieving their goal won't be easy for the boys from Malawi, but who knows, this little friendly in Wrexham could have provided those first important steps. A good pupil often makes the best teacher. It's a philosophy that makes Roberto Mancini the man best suited to guide Lazio back to the top of Italian football. As a player, Mancini stood centre stage for the best part of two decades. 
After starting out at Bologna, Mancini's goals helped both Sampdoria and Lazio win the Scudetto. After hanging up his boots in 2001, he chose to pursue a career in coaching. A brief spell at debt-ridden Fiorentina gave Mancini little chance to impress. His next appointment as Lazio coach last year came as a surprise to many. Plenty predicted that he failed to last the season. However, the man himself took it all in his stride. It's important to know the club, because if you know the team you're coaching, you'll find it easier from the beginning, and it's vital to start well. Mancini's first season in charge saw Lazio clinch a Champions League spot. Given the financial turmoil the club has recently undergone, it was a huge achievement. So impressive, in fact, that he even won over the notoriously difficult Italian press. Mancini represents the glory of Lazio's past. As coach, he's brought youth into the team. The players have great confidence in him. He's created a very close bond between coach and players. He may be the current golden boy of the Italian game, but the Lazio coach is aware that football can be a cruel world. A coach is only as good as his last result. A few new faces to freshen his squad up could see Lazio emerge as serious challengers for the Scudetto. One player who will be looking to impress Mancini is Dejan Stankovic. Since joining Lazio five years ago, the Serbian midfielder has become an important part of the setup. Lazio means a lot to me. I've learnt a lot here. I arrived at Lazio when I was 19 years old and now I'm 25. I now have a family. I've grown up here. Mancini clearly has high hopes that his former teammate can make it all the way to the top. Stankovic is a great player. He's still young. I think he's already among the best midfielders in world football, but I think he can still get even better. After a few barren seasons, this year's Champions League final between Milan and Juventus seemed to indicate that Italian football was back. Italian football never died as such. There have been some difficulties in Europe over the last few years, but it's always been on top. The best players in the world play here. It's the most difficult league, maybe not the most spectacular to watch, but the most difficult to play in. With Stankovic and co ready for the new season, Mancini took his team on a training camp to enjoy the picturesque surroundings of the Dolomites. In preparation for the new campaign, a friendly was arranged with local side Salorno. It was a stroll in the park for Lazio, as they eased past their opposition without breaking into too much of a sweat. For the record, it finished 11-0. Simone Inzaghi and Claudio Lopez instrumental in most of the goals. With Mancini's burning ambition and winning mentality, failure is not an option. The time has come for the Bianco Celesti to deliver. Lazio's fans certainly feel Roberto Mancini is the man to lead them. We believe Lazio could win the Scudetto this year. Mancini is great. He's doing a really good job. He's an excellent coach. I really love Mancini. Sfrenata per Mancini. Born in Porto Alegre, Brazil, his career started here. He's recently moved here. Via here. Oh, and he doesn't come cheap. Ronaldo de Assis Moreira, Ronaldinho to his friends, was always destined to become a footballer from an early age. Skillful, extravagant, he is a footballing genius.
One of his finest displays came in October 2002. PSG were entertaining their old rivals Marseille at the Parc de France. But this was going to be the Ronaldinho show. It all started with a set piece. It evaded everyone, and PSG were one up. Ronaldinho ecstatic. Coach Luis Fernandez dancing with joy. It was all systems go as Ronaldinho proceeded to show off his dazzling skill. Shortly before the break, PSG were awarded a penalty. Batho Ogbeche sent crashing. Could the Parisians double their lead? Only one man was going to take the spot kick. Step forward, Ronaldinho. After composing himself, he dispatched the ball to his right. The goalkeeper went left. 2-0 PSG. By now, Marseille were chasing shadows, and it got worse. A hopeful ball forward was chased down by Martin Cardetti. The Marseille defence throws. Cardetti nodded it in. 3-0, PSG flying. Ronaldinho had the controls. He's now set to win over Barcelona, but Paris will never forget Ronaldinho's footballing genius. The Mapuche Indians are Chile's native people. After centuries of immigration from Europe, they're now in a minority in their own country. But pride in their culture is growing. Role models have been found to support the cause. And among them is a footballer. I think it would be very stupid to be ashamed of my origins. On the contrary, I'm very outspoken about them. I'm not ashamed of being an Indian. Besides, every day there are more players who have an Indian surname. Francesco Wackipan is Mapuche and proud. Since signing for Santiago Giants Colo Colo, Wackipan's popularity has challenged the status of model Jimena Julipan as the most popular native Chilean. He has a strong link with his race. He's proud of being a fighter, proud of being a Mapuche. And this is rare in this country where to be called a Mapuche can be derogatory, like in the case of Marcelo Salas, who doesn't have a close identification with his people. Juventus and former Lazio striker Marcelo Salas is a Chilean football legend. He's from the city of Temuco, the Mapuche area of Chile. Unlike Wackipan, though, Salas is reluctant to discuss his background. Salas is a great player and very popular. Everybody is free to do what he wants. And if he does not like to say he is an Indian, that's his problem. But he should know that his strength and courage are absolutely Indian characteristics. Wackipan signed for Colo Colo from second division side Magallanes. It was the perfect move for the precocious midfielder to showcase his talents. Colo Colo are named after a Mapuche Indian chief. And Wackipan has lived up to his billing as Chile's most popular Mapuche sportsman. He certainly had no trouble settling into his new team. I recognise that he was a player with great technique, a consistent player who was likely to fit in well at the club. He joined here from a second division club, a small club. He's managed to fit in well at Colo Colo, where the pressure is very intense. The club has a big following. Wacky Pan is a real player of the people. And it's not just because of his forthright views on Mapuche rights. He still lives in the notoriously poor La Legua neighborhood. They wanted me to move to residential areas, but I couldn't settle there. 
I came back here because I feel more comfortable here. The people love me here. When I go training in the morning, people spur me on to do well. This helps me to give 100% every day. By standing up for the Mapuche and for the people of the La Legua district, Wacky Pan has helped to confront prejudice. To live here at La Legua is something very important, something that means a lot to me. They say this is a difficult neighbourhood, but amongst us there are plenty of hard-working people. I think I've managed to shut a lot of people up. They now look at La Legua in a different way. A 23, Wacky Pan still has a hugely promising football career ahead of him. But already he has plans for the day he retires, and not surprisingly, it involves the people closest to his heart. I would like to go back to Temuco and have a football academy there and teach the Mapuche kids, show them how they could be the new Wakapan and show the goodness of the Indian race. Francesco Wakipan, not just a footballer, but a spokesman for his people. <laughs> And we'll have another Western Union World Football Report next week.